First Timothy chapter four, verse four. The Holy Spirit clearly says that in the later, latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teaching comes through hypocritical lies whose conscience, liars whose conscience have been seared with iron, hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is concentrated by the word of God and prayer. So what we want to do is, there's two paragraphs. This is the first paragraph. We want to stop and deal with the first paragraph, but instead of giving you points, we're just going to go line by line. And the reason is, there's just... He, he, Paul, when he writes, he writes a book in each sentence, okay? It's not fair to the preachers, okay? Because there's a book in each sentence, okay? And so let's deal with the first one. The Holy Spirit clearly says that in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Okay, when, when Paul is writing this to Timothy, he's not talking about you're going to be a born-again, charismatic Christian, and all of a sudden, the next morning, you're going to wake up and you're with Harry Krishna Church at an airport, okay, selling beads, okay? He's not talking about this. What he's talking about is the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. There are wolves in sheep's clothing that come into the church. Sometimes they're pastors, sometimes they're not. Sometimes they become friends of yours or relatives and stuff like this. They're not there to pull you out of the church, they're just there to make you lukewarm. In Revelation it says, if you are not hot, I will spit you out of my mouth, Jesus says. So what, what Paul is saying here in the first paragraph, the spirit clearly says that in latter times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. All of this is demonic. But here's the craziest thing. Are you ready? You'll never know it. It looks so smooth. Let, let me share this with you. Some of the best preachers out there are not godly at all. They look smooth. They have all the right words. But when you listen to them carefully, where is that in the Bible? Or what they do, here's the big one, are you ready? This is huge. They take this scripture here, and this scripture here, and this scripture here, and they join it together, and they create a theology, but really it's heresy. In my personal opinion, personal opinion, how can you be a preacher today, a minister of the gospel, all your life you've been a minister of the gospel and you have over $700 million worth of asset for yourself and then ask people to give an offering to your ministry when you have five private jets. That doesn't make sense. In my personal opinion, there, see, the, 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 it's not you're going to go from Christianity to Hare Krishna. These guys are just going to come in, or ladies, are just going to come in and water you down. Now, somebody says to me, that's not happening. Yes, it is. The city of Toronto has had this happen in the last couple years. Remember? Big churches with big names, big people going, and they're all preaching all this stuff about, hi, I drink beer, and I have this and that, yeah, I'm a born oh, I'm so cool, da, da, da. And then all of a sudden, the next thing we're reading is he's sleeping with this, 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 that, that, do, do, da, da, da. See, here, here's the craziest thing. A friend might sound smooth and appealing, but is it biblical? A pastor might have the right moves, look really cool, 
but is he or she biblical? So then he goes on and he says, such teaching comes through hypocritical liars whose conscience have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry. Now, let's just stop here. Paul, somebody says, well, Paul forbid people to marry. No, he didn't. He suggested it. Paul said, if you can live life without getting married, that's great. But if you need to get married, get married. Now, I have the highest respect for Pastor Ed. Pastor Ed's not married, okay? And I have the highest respect. Now, I keep looking for a wife for him, okay? But, you know, nobody in the senior citizen's home wants to touch him. But the point is this, that for me, I couldn't do that. I needed a wife, and we won't go into any more details. But the point is this, Paul never forbid, he just suggested it. Now, let, let me go on and give the real one. Okay, are you ready? Well, this is where the dentures dropped, okay? Such teaching comes through hypocritical lies whose conscience have been seared with hot irons. They forbid people to marry, and order them to abstain from certain foods. And then Paul goes on, which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Okay, so, is it wrong to be a vegetarian and a vegan? Are you ready? In the first service, half of them didn't know what a vegan was, okay? And half of them looked at me like vegetarians. I love hiring vegans and vegetarians on staff because when we have lunches here, I get more meat. So somebody says to me, well, you know what, this passage says that all food is blessed of God and thanksgiving. Well, here's the craziest thing, okay? What he's talking about is a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, a, a liar, coming along and making you not eat a certain thing because this guy comes up with a bogus theology. There is nothing wrong with being a vegetarian at all if it's going to help the temple of the Holy Spirit. I have a friend, and I won't mention his name, okay, because Chuck would be upset. <laughs> but he has a hard time with red meat. It affects his stomach and it affects his bowels. Again, I won't mention who he is, but Chuck has this tremendous problem. Therefore, we eat at Red Lobster because he can eat fish and digest it properly. Now, here, here's the craziest thing. Somebody says, oh, if you don't eat meat, you are not of God, for God created steaks, God created hamburger. Hallelujah, I believe that. But here's the craziest thing. Go read the book of Daniel. Daniel's diet was vegetables. Di Daniel refused to take the pork, refused to take the bacon, which I don't mind, because I get more. But here's the craziest thing. So what happens is there's people coming into the church during Paul's time, and they're creating this bogus theology that is demonic. Now, somebody says to me, Give me a modern day version of this. Are you ready? Pay attention. Give me the picture of myself when I was four years old. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? Isn't, aren't I cute? <laughs> that is ungodly. You wanna know why? My family was pressured by the church 
If you showed up to church without a tie on, even as a four-year-old, it's wrong. Our churches, when I was young, if you didn't have a dress on and you were a lady or a young girl, a young girl shows up even four years of age with pants on, no, dresses. Can you imagine, this added an hour extra to my mother's Sunday morning, trying to get a four-year-old who is hyperactive to comb my hair with Brill Cream, okay, which is demonic, and then put a suit on and a tie. And in the winter time, they never bought me dress pants. That I had to wear shorts to church. And I would come walking in and all the us, oh, you look so godly, you look like a Christian. Where is that in the Bible? Here's one for you. I love the King James Bible. I love the King James Bible. But when I was growing up, King James Bible was the only Bible that God has ordained. And I was shocked when I became a teenager and found out that the King James Bible is a translation from the Greek. I thought Jesus spoke King James. I honestly believe that Jesus spoke, verily, verily, I say unto thee, okay? And nobody in the church even knows what a verily, verily is. Now, am I mocking King James Bible? No, I love King James Bible. But the, 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 the craziness and what Paul is saying here is this, that we need to be able to be biblical. Let me read the next paragraph. If you point these things out to your brother or sister, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus nourished on the truth of the faith and of the good teachings that you have followed, have nothing to do with godless myths or old wives' tales, such as Christians only wear ties. Rather, train yourself to be godly, for physical training is some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for the, both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Let's deal with the first one. Good ministers. There's three things good ministers do. Number one, they point out non-biblical lifestyle, but they do it gently. Jesus Christ, John chapter three, verse 17, he never came to condemn, he came to save. Galatians chapter six says, gently restore you, brothers and sisters. Jesus never came for you to thump somebody out of hell into heaven. Jesus came to love. The woman at the well, he deals with her gently and works her through. Nicodemus, he deals with him academically and works him through. Zacchaeus, come on down out of the tree. We're going to your house instead of the church, and we're going to deal with your spirit. See, here's the thing. Point out the non-biblical lifestyle by pointing to the biblical lifestyle. Number two, nourish the truth of the faith. The other day, I wanted an orange, and I cut an orange, and I sucked on it, and then I ate it. And all the nourishment I got from it, it was incredible. And when it says nourish the truth of the faith, the, the, it means take the, the, the orange juice out of the Word of God, the stuff that's going to give you energy, the stuff that's going to give you vibe. Take it out of the Word of God because your life is not built on philosophy and, and, and psychology. Your life is built on the Word of God. What does the Word of God want me to do? What does the Holy Spirit want me to do? And then good teaching. Good teaching. Don't build your teaching on anything else, but this is what the Bible says. This is what the Bible says. Let, let, let me take you about a good minister. Are you ready? And, and this, it hurts telling this story, and I'm sure people will be upset, but it doesn't matter. When, when I became an ordained minister, which means I became a reverend, 
my, my title is Reverend Billy Richards, Reverend. If you look at some of the documents that are sent to me, it will have R-E-V in it. And so many non-Christians think, why would you put reverse in front of your name, okay? Like, it doesn't make sense, okay? It's not, it's reverend, which is taken out of the word reverence, which really bothers me. In order to become a reverend in a denomination, and I wasn't trying to, you have to jump a lot of hurdles. Example, you have to go to Bible college or seminary and so forth. I got a master's in biblical education and missiology and communication because, of, and then what happens is you have to do um, two or three years. How, how many years did you do, Ed? Three? Four. Four years Ed had to jump through a hoop before he became a reverend. The night that they were going to ordain me, ordain means they're going to take me from Mr. Billy Richards to Reverend Billy Richards. It's a big ceremony, big ceremony. I mean, you gotta wear a suit and everything like this. And I didn't wanna go because I really couldn't care less if I'm a reverend. And, and, and then they had this rehearsal. Can you imagine a rehearsal before the ordination where we had to walk on like monkeys and sit in suits and, and sit prop, and we all looked like, oh. it was just, oh. okay. And, and my wife told me to be good and try my best. And uh, my parents showed up because they were going to take pictures and okay, it was like, oh, just shoot me. So what happened is the night we're sitting there on the platform looking like monkeys and all these people, guys and girls are getting up to become reverends and they're crying about, oh, this is the greatest night of my life. I can't believe I've lived all my life to become. And I'm just sitting there like, come on, let's get this over with. Harvey closes in an hour. Okay, we can't get a hamburger. Okay, and, and I'm sitting there and finally they, I'm last. I don't know why they chose me to be last, but everybody had to give a speech and everybody's crying and and I've had enough. I mean, I'm sorry, I've had enough. And I got up and I said to the whole audience, I would like to just say this before I become a reverend. I'm not really sure if I really want it. If you're gonna call it, please don't call me. But I need to tell you something. Every one of you out there, you're just as much a minister as I am. And God has called you to be a minister where you are, and God's called me to be a minister where I am. And I'm no better than you, and you're no better than me. We are all ministers together. And that's what the audience did. They started clapping. But the bishops on the stage, their teeth, there their teeth go, and their pants, and it was, oh! And I knew afterwards that I was dead. And when they called me in, and they said, we nearly strip you of your reverend, which would have been a great thing, I said to them, tell me biblically how I'm better than my people in my congregation, but don't tell me your myths or your wise tales, tell me the Bible. And with that, the meeting was over. <laughs> because none of them had a Bible with them. So here's the practical lessons for today. Are you ready? Here it is. No godliness, myths, or old wise tales. Here's one my brother sent me. Uh, I love this. God helps them. God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. What do you do with the life of Paul? 
He was in jail for the gospel. He, the, the boat nearly sunk and he nearly drowned. He was martyred to death. Hello, if you look at this, God helps those who help themselves. Usually people who help themselves are self-centered. Selfish. A wise tale. Uh, oh, uh, here, here's, here, here's one for you. W growing up, I was taught, and not in my family I was taught this, but I was taught this by the church I attended. Are you ready? I was taught that if you're Roman Catholic, you're going to hell. Honest. I believed, uh, I was taught by Sunday school teachers that the Pope was demonic. Whenever I saw the Pope on television, I honestly believe, ooh, there's the demon. Are you ready? I believed this until I was 21 years old. I mean, if a girl in high school wanted to go out for, on a date with me, and she was wrong, I can't go out with you, you're not a Christian. She would go, I'm Catholic. i go, Catholics aren't Christians. And then all of a sudden, I'm working for this Christian organization called Huntley Street, and one of their employees is a Catholic priest, which I couldn't figure out, how can a Catholic priest be working for this organization? And the Catholic priest, Father Bob McDougall, said to me, I think you have a problem with Catholics. And I looked at him and I said, I think Catholics aren't Christians. And he said, good, come with me to a prayer meeting tonight. Let's see if you're right. And so I went with him to the Archdiocese of Toronto headquarters, and in there was a prayer room. It was around 25 feet by 25 feet, and there were chairs all around it, and when we walked in, we were late. The whole room was full of nuns and priests with their robes and habits, and, and I walk in with my blue jeans T-shirt, and Bob walks in with his tie, and all of a sudden, I sat down beside a nun on this side and a priest on this side, and I felt really weird. And then Bob says to the priests and nuns, hey, let's pray. And I thought, rosary beads are going to come out, and, 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 and Hail Marys are going to fly, and, and uh, you know, we're going to... And I thought, oh, Jesus, help me. And all of a sudden, this little nun beside me, she raises her hands like this and starts speaking in tongues and crying. The priest beside me gets down on his knees and starts calling for revival in Jesus' name for the city of Toronto. And I'm looking at all these people, and nobody's doing a Mary or beads but they're calling on the name of the Lord, just like Pentecostals. And all of a sudden, Bob comes over and says, you know, you could stop looking and you could start praying with us. <laughs> so afterwards, we go to Harvey's for a hamburger, and Bob and another priest are sitting there and saying, so what's your hang up? I said, praying to Mary, confession box, all this stuff. And, and they said, well, we don't pray to Mary. Some Catholics do. We don't believe it. We believe she's respected and she's a great woman of, of God and God used her and powerful and we have the highest respect, but we don't pray because she's not divine. I said, well, how about the confession box? Well, Billy, open your Bible. It says, if we confess our sins to each other, he's faithful and just, and he will heal us of our sin. The Bible tells us confess. So what we do is we help people by having them come in and talk to us about their sins and then we, some of us pray and then there's some that do other things that we disagree with. And then he looked at me and he said this. He said, all you Pentecostals, like are you really 100% accurate theologically too? And I looked at him and I said, no. He says, 
Well, he says, you know, he said, there are some of us who really do love Jesus and he is Lord, and we are trying to follow the Bible. And all of a sudden, God started convicting me about painting a brush for everybody. Painting a brush for everybody the same way. And all of a sudden, my heart started getting hurt because I saw the division in the church where there's Baptists and Alliance and Pentecostals and, and um, um, other denomination, ally, uh, Missionary Alliance and all this stuff. And, and, and in my heart, I just started seeing the New Testament where there shouldn't be division. Yes, I speak in tongues, and you're a Baptist, and you don't speak in tongues. That's all right. You and I are brothers in the Lord. The church is one. Jesus is the head of the church. Yes, you know, my foot is different than my hand, but that doesn't mean we're not one. And I've seen the demonic power of God, the demonic power of hell, who wanted to divide the work of God by creating denominationalism and creating all this stuff and if we were all one under Christ Jesus, we could win the whole world to Jesus. Amen. Godless myths and old wise tales, oh my goodness. So what does he say? Instead of that, what do you do? You, you train them to be godly. Now somebody says to me, what does that mean, train them to be godly? Are you ready? It's not a question of you knowing the Bible. It's the question of you experiencing the Bible. Atheists know the Bible. A good minister is somebody who trains them not to just know the Bible, but to experience the Bible. Why am I Pentecostal, not denomination, but in experience? Because when I was a teenager, I read Acts chapter two, and I saw these crazy people, 120 in a, in a prayer room, speaking in tongues, and I said, I want that! And then I went over to Acts 10, and I saw them speaking in tongues, I want that! Acts 19, I want that! I just don't want to read about it! What is godliness? Godliness is experiencing the Bible. Jesus said in the sower of the parable, when good soil hears, retains, persevere, and produce, what do you do with Acts 2? You hear it, you retain it, you persevere, and you produce. What do you produce? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're producing the Holy Spirit coming through so it can touch the most unruly member of your body, your tongue, and you start to speak in a language only the Holy Spirit has given you. Here's the truth. Train them in godliness. Parents, listen to me. Don't let your kids just know the Bible. Let them experience the Bible. My dad, when I was young, and somebody would come over the house, my dad had anointing oil. Many times my dad would come to me and say, okay, we're gonna pray for this person, I'm gonna anoint them with oil, but I want you to anoint them with oil too. And the two of us would go up to my aunt or my uncle, or, and the two of us, why? The prayer of a child is just as strong as an adult, or even stronger. So here's the application, because I'm getting carried away and I'm hungry. 1 Timothy 4.10, this is why we labor and strive because we have put our hope in the living God who is the savior of all people and especially for those who believe. Let me just read this first. This is why we labor and strive because we put our hope in the living God. What is a good minister? You are a good minister, but what is God calling you to do today? Here's the application, are you ready? You have to labor, work. It just doesn't happen. Oh God, open the doors so I can minister. Ha! 
If you're waiting for the doors to open, they'll never happen. You have to work at it. You have, Jesus had to reach out to the woman at the well. Jesus had to say, Zacchaeus, come down, we're going to your house. Jesus talked to Nicodemus late at night. He didn't say, it's late at night, come back tomorrow. Being a good minister takes work, and all of hell is going to try to stop you from laboring. Number two, strive. You know what the word strive means? Paul talks about this, running the race, where it's not just a question of I'm running with everybody, I'm striving to win. I'm pushing myself. Isn't it crazy how we always make time for things we want to do? Well, all of hell is going to make you not want to be a good minister. But Paul is saying to Timothy, be a good minister. How? Labor and strive. Why? So we can, you can put your hope in the living God and you can help others put their hope in the living God and help them to have godliness, experiencing the word. David Wilkerson, great, one of the greatest men in the last hundred years, he, he pastored in Pennsylvania, a little church. He had a white picket fence. His family was happy. Everything was going good. I mean, the guy literally was a redneck. He, he, to, to put him in a city, it totally, and yet God called him from this little town in Pennsylvania to New York City to start a church, to start an organization called Teen Challenge helping drug addicts and gang members get off the street. And, and he, Lord, what are you doing? He knows nothing. He's white. He knows nothing about multicultural. He's never eaten anything except roast beef and potatoes. <laughs> Yet he takes this white, white redneck and puts him in the roughest part of New York City. And this white guy is standing out on the corner in the roughest neighborhood in New York City preaching, Jesus loves you. Nikki Cruz, the gang leader of the Mau Mau's, was so upset, Nikki Cruz came up to him and says, and took his switchblade and put it under his neck, says, I'm going to cut you in a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson, without flinching, goes, well, every piece will say, Jesus loves you, Nikki, go ahead. And then Nikki then David Wilkerson had this um, church service in the theater, and he invited Nikki. And only a handful of people came, but Nikki and his whole gang showed up. And it was time to take the offering. And David Wilkerson said, I don't have any ushers. And Nikki said, We'll take the offering. So the gang took the offering. And when I say the gang took the offering, they took the offering. But here's the thing that shook Nicky Cruz, was this guy wasn't talking off the cuff or blowing wind. He could see Jesus in David Wilkerson. And when he, David Wilkerson started teaching Nicky and the other drug addicts, other gang members about the Bible, he would then start praying with them so they could experience the Bible. And Nicky Cruz, when I met with him, I had supper with him downtown, and then I was in Montreal with him speaking at a conference. He says, it wasn't a question of knowing the Bible. He says, it was experiencing the Bible. And you, up in the balcony, you under the balconies, and you at the back, who say, I can't see you. And especially you on live stream. You listen to me. You can hide from me and you can hide from everybody else, but you're not hiding from God. This day, God is calling you to be a good minister.